Before we talk about the most viscerally uncomfortable experience I've had watching a movie in years, I feel it is important to address one of the most viscerally horrifying things I have watched ever. Something I didn't do in my previous video because it was filmed before George Floyd's murder at the hands of police. What happened in Minneapolis was shocking and horrifying and disgusting and any number of other adjectives, but it was also unsurprising. Look, I'm clearly not the right messenger for this or probably most of what I'm going to be talking about in this video, and you should listen to people who have lived these experiences instead of me. But while you're here, know that George Floyd's life mattered, just as Breonna Taylor's did, and Eric Garner's, and Tamir Rice's, and Michael Brown's, Philano Castile's, Baltham Jean's, and everyone else who didn't receive the kind of nationwide attention that they did. Their lives mattered, and they are gone because of the color of their skin. They were victims of a system that was built on the backs of people who looked like them and yet remain seen and treated as second-class citizens or worse. This is not a few bad apples. This is America, and it needs to change. Black Lives Matter. It took me a long time to work up the courage to watch The Nightingale. I had been excited to see what Jennifer Kent would do to follow up her excellent debut feature, the modern horror classic that is The Babadook. But after the initial response when it premiered at Venice in 2018, I wasn't really sure that I could handle it. By all accounts, it was incredibly powerful, receiving superlatives up to and including full-on masterpiece. But even if it pushes back against all of the tropes and ideas that the label implies, it still loosely adheres to a rape-revenge structure. And so to get to this deeply meaningful and human drama, you have to get through the pain. But in 2014, I made a conscious decision to avoid filmic depictions of rape, not just revenge films, all of them. And to be clear, it's not like I was all gung-ho about them before then, but my interest in disturbing cinema and the history of exploitation films meant that I saw it a fair amount, particularly in college where I did a few research projects on those topics. I'd already started moving away from that by the time I sat down in the Walter Reed Theater for Lee Soo Jin's absolutely devastating Hong Kong Jew. But that movie just kind of broke my brain a little bit. I sobbed while watching it the way a friend of mine did while watching The Nightingale. I had talked with him and several other people about what this film contained. I knew that there were two scenes of sexual violence against protagonist Claire Carroll, an Irish convict brought to the British penal colony now called Tasmania, and that one of them included regular violence against her family as well. And it just sounded like too much, so I avoided it. I don't know what exactly changed. I recently found out that it is available to watch on Hulu and the ease of access was a factor, but I honestly think the horror of this moment just grabbed me and said, well, now's your chance. Everything's already awful. Will these 136 minutes really make it that much worse? And it seemed like sound logic, even if in the end it wasn't entirely correct. Because the horrors depicted here are not terribly disconnected from those in this moment. You see, while I had talked to people about the content of what would happen to Claire, we never got into the point of context. I didn't know the foundational line that played in the trailer. You know what it's like to have a white fella take everything you have, don't you? Claire says this to Billy, an aboriginal tracker she has hired to help her find the men she intends to get revenge on. He doesn't know, at first, that that is her mission, and he wouldn't have accepted it if he did. In fact, he tried to say no when he thought she was just trying to meet her husband. But she offers to pay handsomely, all of the money that she has, and some she doesn't yet. So he accepts. But she doesn't trust him. She believes that she knows what people like him do to people like her, and keeps him away, up on her horse, pointing her rifle at him. 
Now remember, Claire is a convict who has been shipped to a penal colony. Those with power dismiss her out of hand because of who she is. She can show an officer a corpse and tell the truth about what happened, and it won't matter. It would be her word against the word of someone who society has deemed to be trustworthy. And we're in 1825. No cameras can reveal the truth of the situation. What they say happened is what happened. And while much of that would be true, even if she were a convicted man, her being a woman makes her doubly disadvantaged. Because she's seen as less trustworthy in general. And then she is judged for the things that people do to her. For the fact that she cannot stop a man who sees her literally, not figuratively, as his property from exploiting her. She appears late to pick up her child because she was being brutalized and the others chastise her for it. And it just makes the moment so much worse because they know why she was late and they hate her for it all the more. These expectations of womanhood are in direct contrast with the realities of being a convict. During that time especially, but in many cultures, during kinda all times. The man here is one Lieutenant Hawkins, who oversees the area. And to him, women like Claire and men like Billy are equally subhuman, only good as long as he can get something from them, either with money or violence. But critically, Claire doesn't see it that way. She sees Billy as well below her, because he's black and indigenous. And Kent wanted to really reckon with this specific era of Australian history. She spent years researching it, had an Aboriginal advisor, and cast actual Aboriginal actors to ensure authenticity in her depiction. It is a uniquely Australian story in a way that I cannot understand, but at the same time, it's not like this doesn't exist elsewhere. What Australia has done to Aboriginal communities is a lot like what America did to its indigenous populations. And the system of oppression it all represents is universal. Those at the highest levels exploit biases at lower levels to keep oppressed peoples feeling superior enough to believe that they have a common enemy looking down, when the truth is that the real common enemy is the one on top. Eventually, Claire comes to understand this, as we return to that critical line. You know what it's like to have a white fella take everything you have, don't you? And he does even more than he realizes when the two of them set off into the woods together. Kent has said in interviews that she believes the Nightingale is ultimately about finding empathy and love in dark times. And so it becomes something of a love story, albeit not a sexual or necessarily even romantic one. It's about two humans who are able to connect in the midst of horror. And although it's not classified as a horror film, I don't think you'd be wrong to call it one anyway. It's not scary in the way that the Babadook is, but the world that Claire inhabits is a dangerous one for her. And we see it from that perspective. Even if you went into the film not knowing what was to come, you would be put on edge almost immediately. Within a minute, of the opening shot, Claire lit by candlelight as her husband comes and kisses her and their baby goodbye, we see the fear. She sings to her child, cradled in one arm as she walks along a forest path, but she's looking into the trees. Her other hand, kept by her side, grips a knife. She's serving a regiment of soldiers, and we see her strength when a man jeers at her, and she knocks the cup over onto him and walks away but her strength and resolve cannot stop the man who controls her fate, who gets to decide when or even if she is finally a free woman. I'm glad that I knew in vague terms what I was in for, that there were two scenes and how they had impacted people because I was able to brace myself in the beginning. You might think that first assault is more than enough. Objectively, it's not very long, but it feels like an eternity. And the shot it ends on in front of Ashlyn Franchosi as her face goes completely blank is nightmare fuel. But I knew that it would only get worse from there. <laughs> and it did. So much more than I could have even imagined. 
It's worth noting that none of this is really graphic. Indeed, the film in general is more restrained than you might expect or may even realize. Sure, blood gets spilled, but far less than you'd see in a typical R-rated action movie or even a PG-13 one. But it's much more intense because Kent was interested in depicting what she calls true violence. True violence is abhorrent. It has consequences. It destroys lives. Too often, violence as first response is glamorized and valorized in media and culture. It's one of the primary reasons so many people are marching right now. But the Nightingale is having none of that. This type of violence may bear some superficial resemblance to your typical cinematic violence, but you can feel the difference. Take those two scenes. Kent was, and presumably still is, bothered by the fact that during most movie rapes, Actors have their clothes ripped off in the struggle, exposing their bodies and giving something for audience members to distract themselves with, perhaps even be titillated by. In much the same way as so many anti-war movies inadvertently glorify a violent fantasy, these scenes play into a type of sexual fantasy. The Nightingale refuses to glorify anything or make it a fantasy. Claire remains clothed throughout, which keeps the attention on her experience and the physical and emotional pain that she is suffering. There is no way for that moment to be seen as anything but the violence that it is. And it's hard to overstate just how awful watching that second scene in particular is. But it needs to be. There is no other way to depict that but as the traumatizing thing that it is. Now, I realized about halfway through that I was digging my unexpectedly sharp nails into the fleshy part of my palm, and it hurt. But I was too physically tense to let go. I gripped so hard, I was a little surprised at the other end to see that I hadn't drawn blood. But as I looked at the indents in my skin, I was finally able to take a breath. I knew that, although there was plenty of horror to come, the worst was over. And now it was time to try and work through the trauma we had just seen, and maybe, hopefully, find some kind of catharsis. That journey comes with a heightened reality, literally in the sense that the film was shot in the Academy ratio, itself much taller than movies tend to be these days. But it's appropriate here, allowing you to see more of the characters in frame with less unimportant things on the periphery, while also emphasizing the enormity of the forest that much of the film is spent in. There are over a hundred locations there, each clearly mapped out to match the psyche of the characters at that moment. Kent refers to that place as mythical, and leaned into that aspect of it to emphasize the drama while remaining grounded in historical truth. You're not meant to notice it, but it brings you further into their experience and increases your ability to empathize with them rather than merely sympathize. Because empathy is what it's all about. The Nightingale makes very clear that revenge killing or violence of any kind will not fix Claire. That there's nothing that she can do to Hawkins or anyone else that will make her better. She will never be the same person who she was. That doesn't mean she cannot move forward, but that to do so, she must move on. She cannot follow her past, but has to find a new future. And if she can look into the darkness and find empathy and love, it will be possible for her to breathe again. 9.0 out of 10. Thank you for watching, and thank you particularly to my patrons, my mom, Hammer and Marco, Kat Saracata, Benjamin Schiff, Anthony Cole, at Blasian FMA, Magnolia Denton, Elliot Fowler, and Greg Lucina. If you like this video, great. If not, I'm sorry. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe. I hope to see you next week.